Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Observer Intelligence Podcast. My name is Hospital Yadi. I have a very special guest with me today, uh, Dr. John Hedgren. Um, I made sure I pronounce his uh, last name correctly. Uh, John has a lot of experience in machine learning, teaching, and research side of machine learning. So I'm going to read his bio first prior to going to a, 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 a uh, various topics that we're very excited to discuss today. So John received his, his PhD in chemical engineering from University of Texas at Austin and is an associate professor at um, um, Brigham, uh, Brigham Young University. Uh, previously, he uh, worked with ExxonMobil on advanced process control. His primary research focuses on accelerating machine learning and, and automating and, 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 and automation technology across industries. Other research interests include fiber optic monitoring, um, intelligent fields, reservoir optimization, drilling automation, nuclear hybrid energy systems, and uh, unmanned aerial systems. He is a leader of the Center of Unmanned um, Aircraft uh, Systems, CUAS, applying UAV automation and optimization technology to energy infrastructure. He was an SPE Distinguished Lecturer in 2019, where I, um, they actually I met him uh, in 2016 uh, during one of the SPE events. Uh, so with that being said, uh, John, it was a pleasure and honor to have you. Uh, we're, I'm very excited for, like, for this podcast. Well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me, Haas. I really appreciate it. And I've also appreciated some of these other podcasts that you've given. I've listened to a few of them and, and appreciate the guests that you have and their perspectives as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. So I guess uh, first, let's start off with the overall uh, vision for the future of AI and automation in, in various industries, because I know you've been involved in various like in like industry. So can you talk about your overall vision uh, for the future of AI and automation in various industries? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that a lot of people interact with AI almost on a daily basis now. So sometimes you realize it and sometimes you don't, you know, the auto completion on text messages, on emails, your spam filtering, that's really helped clean up inboxes uh, and also technologies that are coming like, you know, self-driving cars or, you know, there's things happening kind of behind the scenes like traffic predictions and, you know, how they manage stoplights. Um, you know, even things like medical diagnosis, where they can take a picture of something, uh, uh, something on your skin, and it can help to diagnose, you know, what that problem is. Uh, you know, even like with your credit card, if you've ever received a notification, you know, from your credit card that, you know, this purchase looked a little bit suspicious, could you verify that it was an actual purchase? So a lot of things are happening right now with, you know, machine learning companies are adopting those. Some of them have been very successful and some of them have been very difficult to apply. And, and so there's, I, I guess my vision for it is that, you know, we're going to see more and more applications as, as people, you know, researchers or practitioners are trying to implement these uh, methods and really creating value cases uh, for these applications. Okay, nice, nice. And, and so um, which industries do you think would be at the forefront of applying AI to automate routine tasks? We see some areas where, you know, not just AI, but also automation are having a big impact on, uh, you know, disruptions in, in certain industries. You look at retail with how things are purchased and going to be delivered, also transportation, you know, self-driving vehicles and others. So there's some, there are some technologies that are coming that are still in their infancy right now being, being tested and proven that are really going to have a transformative effect on, on, what, on how we're going to be able to interact with some of these uh, machines that uh, will help to enhance our, our livelihood. I think one of the things that's, you know, kind of at the forefront of uh, to automate routine tasks that are going to have probably the biggest effect on us is just our personal assistance on our cell phone. Any apps that are running on our cell phone, that's the, kind of the technology we use most often. And there are going to be ways that, you know, change the, the way we buy things, uh, the way we, um, you know, even organize our day, what we work on helps us stay organized and, and up to date. 
So I, I think there's a lot that's going to be going on with some of these new technologies, but the biggest impact is probably going to be what's on our cell phone. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's a, that's a good prediction. We should put it in there and <laughs> the next few years, just watch out for that, you know? <laughs> uh, and also, um, so now that we talked about, you know, the overall vision for different industries and some of the impacts, um, what is your vision for the oil and gas industry in particular? Yeah, so there have been some areas where it's really had a big impact already. Uh, you know, for example, geologists to help them identify hydrocarbon resources from seismic data, uh, you know, identify patterns, where are, uh, you know, the payloads, where, where should they be looking? Uh, you know, so that's just one example of where it's already had a big impact and a lot of companies are already uh, moving in that direction or have moved in that direction. You also have a lot with equipment health monitoring. Uh, they can look at signals and be able to detect, you know, what's happening uh, with that piece of equipment. So it's kind of analogous to what's happening in other industries as well. You know, jet airliners, they produce about 50,000 gigabytes an hour of data, just the vibration data, temperatures and other things. And they look for early signs of, of failures uh, for that equipment. The same thing is happening with, you know, pumps, compressors, valves, other things in, in the oil and gas industry that we can monitor our equipment and have early warning signs that something is going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there are other areas as well. You know, we think about like the BP Macondo well incident and kick detection where you have unexpected gas influx coming into the well bore. There are methods that have been applied to help detect kicks earlier. And, and so you can respond faster. So, so you've kind of got two things in the oil and gas industry. And one is, and there's different levels of AI and automation, how those are being applied. One is more of like an advisory system where it helps humans do their job better. And, and then uh, kind of as a next step uh, in the oil and gas industry, it's going to be having those same advisory systems start to close the loop, start to actually make automated decisions uh, where we get to more high, or higher levels of automation with things like drilling automation or directional drilling, or uh, even helping the geologists automatically uh, pick out uh, the, best, the best regions for uh, drilling potential. Got it. Got it. So I know you touched on some of these uh, machine learning applications, like the predictive maintenance, like the geology. Do you have any other applications that you'd like to touch on? Well, yeah, there are um, you know, many other applications that are under development as well. One of the, the challenges with digitalization and automation is that it creates a potential for bad actors to have influence over your equipment and there's a lot of cybersecurity concerns as well. And so one of the other areas that a lot of companies are working on right now is just how to ensure the integrity of these systems that they're building. And, and that goes with, uh, you can use AI to detect when a bad actor is manipulating a signal, uh, you know, if they, have, if they have already gained access to the system or when they're trying to penetrate the system. So you can look for signals across an ethernet uh, cable. So even companies have developed uh, specific sensors that, um, you know, that basically uh, go around a wire. So they're completely external to the system itself that can detect when somebody is trying to do something uh, bad to your system or there's a different signal that's, uh, that's coming in. So, so we see, you know, not only the equipment kind of the, from the technical side in, uh, you know, exploration and production, but also from the IT side, a lot more on the AI to help workers be productive, keep the right people uh, in and keep the wrong people out. Got it. Got it. Yeah, these are very valid points, especially on the cybersecurity side. If you look at the job jobs available in, in, the, in the cybersecurity like industry in the past couple of years, it's been like, you know, crazy, you know, and, and, and I think that that's, part of the reason, as you mentioned on the AI, you know, that, that cyber, you know, security becomes very important at that point. And you got to have those, 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 um, 
security checks to make sure uh, the bad actors are, are actually eliminated, you know? So, and, and so I know you've been involved in a lot of the drilling automation side. Um, can you touch on some of the drilling AI projects you've been working on, um, I think in, in school and also uh, in the industry? Yeah, so I work you know, at a university. So a lot of my work is at the concept stage to demonstrate the strengths or limitations of an idea. And so we get a lot of people that come to our research group and say, well, we have this idea. Uh, could you help us uh, develop it? Or, you know, they come to us and say, what's your vision? What's your idea? And then we help craft a vision together. Uh, and sometimes when we, when we work on projects like, you know, drilling AI projects that like you mentioned, sometimes the answer is um, it's going to need this additional sensor or this is not possible and, and sometimes that answer of this isn't possible is just as valuable as this is possible and has a lot of potential. So organizations don't spend a lot of time and uh, resources to commercialize the technology. But let me just talk just a little bit about uh, some of the projects we've been working on. You know, I mentioned the, you mentioned the UAVs or the unmanned aerial vehicles or uh, also known as drones in, in the, um, you know, the introduction. Uh, one of the things we do is we help geologists uh, explore geologic outcrops by flying drones over those areas. And if I could, I'll just go ahead and share. Um, let me go and just share my desktop here. And I'll, I'll uh, share just a, one of the models that we had from that. So, so this is, uh, geologists will probably know, uh, Son of Blaze Canyon that is... Um, all right, so let's see if I can share my screen. And okay, so these are some of the 3D models uh, that we have here. And I'll go ahead and just open up. This is one we did uh, quite a few years ago. And you can see uh, now a geologist can go virtually to this area and be able to explore the geologic outcrop and and notice features like this where you can see uh, an ancient river that carved away uh, in the formation and so it helps uh, give the geologist somewhat of an analog of uh, to help them explore uh, with these these outcrops so this is one of the the uh, well-known uh, geologic outcrops it's located in utah so that's just one way where we use um, we actually use drones, but we, it's very difficult to develop some of these models. So we use machine learning to help us improve the models. We tell the algorithm, we say the end objective is that we want a good model of this geologic outcrop. How should you fly? And we put the drone down and it flies itself, collects the images, and then generates these models. So we're able to take uh, machine learning and be able to improve uh, improve some of these models, and and let me talk uh, specifically about just a couple of the other applications that we work on as well. So there's a there's a company in Provo uh, that works on embedding uh, high speed connection data connection into the drill string, and so you can get you know this high speed data down to the drill bit. And when they first came out with that technology, they, they came to us and said, well, we're, you know, what's the value proposition of more data? Could you help us understand that? Mm -hmm. And so we did a, a number of different studies to show how you know, directional drilling could be improved, how kick detection could be improved, how, you know, and all of these case studies went in to help develop the momentum toward things like wired drill pipe or high-speed communication to, to what's going you know, down hole. So, um, so I guess in, in, in summary, you know, we have at the university, we're more interested in conceptual ideas, you know, kind of an early phase of the technology development. And one of the exciting things is even with the current downturn, we're still seeing very healthy interest in terms of automation and machine learning companies see that almost as an enabler to help them be competitive in a low price market. Yeah, that's a very fair point. And I mean, if, 
if companies still have interest in automation and, and basically digitalization in this commodity pricing, can you imagine how would how this would look like in a much higher commodity pricing, you know? And, and that's a fair point. And also, what kind of technological advancements in AI are you mostly bullish about, you know, in the next few years, especially in the oil and gas industry? Well, as I mentioned, the you know the current downturn. I mean, oil and gas has had many cycles, and the gas industry has, has come back uh, very strong, you know, from from all of those cycles. One of the things that I think is is a little bit interesting about this current cycle is that many experienced leaders in the industry have retired or some even young workers have moved to other industries. Mm -hmm. And so those that remained are tasked with not only preserving that knowledge, but also doing the work of probably several others. And, and I think one of the things that is exciting about machine learning is it enables people to be more effective at decision-making, be able to understand data to help them move forward with the best decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and then we also even try to capture uh, you know, from experienced operators or others, you try to capture that experience in some of these machine learned models. So what you can do is go back through history and learn from what happened before to help improve future operations. So, so I, th I think with this current cycle and just the, the people resources, there's a big opportunity for AI machine learning to come in and assist those who are uh, who remain in those positions to make better decisions. Um, so, so I, so I'm really excited about that. I think, especially advisory systems to start with, and then later on, it's going to be fully automate, full automation. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. That's a good. That's a good area. I think people usually don't touch on that, you know. Uh, but advisory system, huh? I actually never, never thought about that before. That, that's a, that's a good idea, I think. And and so, um, what are I know, like in school, you know, as like as you said, you guys work on like early type of technologies, like phase one almost, you know. Uh, so what are some of the, I know you touched on couple, but can you touch on more projects that you guys are currently working on um, in school that could have a tremendous positive impact on the industry? Of course, non-confidential projects, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the biggest impact on the industry is really uh, going to be how we train people to use the technology. And so I just finished a four-day training uh, with South, in South Korea, did it remotely, but, you know, from the U.S. got to work some uh, nights <laughs> to, to do that, but worked with a group of about 74 individuals very interested in machine learning and AI uh, from a, across a lot of different industries there. And, and then I also am starting up a, a new online course. It starts this next week on machine learning and dynamic optimization it's been interesting. I've, I've never seen as, as much interest as this year. There are 850 people registered for that. So it's going to be a big course. And then, uh, you know, just through the YouTube channel that I host, uh, you know, there's about 10,000 people per day that go on and watch, you know, the videos about automation and machine learning and other topics I've posted. So I think, you know, the in terms of having an impact on the industry, there's things that I can do, but really... I think my role as an educator is to help others be able to acquire those skills and gain a vision for, uh, you know, this is, you know, even if they're just kind of curious about the technology, a manager or, you know, they're not going to be working with uh, computer code on a daily basis, but they just want to kind of see the potential. How can this be applied? What's the application? And, and I think in terms of a current project that I'm working on, it's, and some of these educational resources that are going to help elevate, uh, especially those in the oil and gas industry who are maybe looking to retool uh, or, or else expand their knowledge in, in some of these topics. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then we have a number of, of other projects that we're working on uh, with digitalization, uh, cybersecurity, and uh, some of our drilling automation projects have have uh, been put on pause just because of budgets. Uh, but I think those are gonna start back up again, you know, once uh, the oil price recovers. 
I got you. Okay. And uh, like in terms of like machine learning types, you know, I, I like if you look at, for example, one Petro uh, or like a lot of the books that have been published in the past, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on supervised learning, uh, some on unsupervised. Um, there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on reinforcement learning. Uh, so which type of machine learning um, do you think, uh, do you foresee to have the most impact uh, in the oil and gas industry? And what's your vision for reinforcement? You know, because that's, that's one of the areas that um, a lot of people haven't even explored yet. Um, but I think there might be some potential that, that people are missing, you know. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I think the thing with, you know, those three methods that you mentioned, supervised, unsupervised, and then reinforcement, um, you know, first of all, I, th I think it's important, you know, for uh, just to define those, you know, supervised learning is where you have uh, labels for your data. And so you can learn from the correct answer and then also evaluate because you have another test set that also has the correct answers. And you say, well, what's the, you know, how well am I doing against these correct answers? Um, so it might be like, you give it some drilling data. You said, well, this is where there was a kick and this is where there wasn't a kick. Can you distinguish between the two because we've given you labeled data? And then unsupervised learning, it's, it's more valuable for cases where you don't necessarily have those labels. So let's say you have a lot of drilling data, but you don't have any kicks in there. You could say, well, let me try to run unsupervised learning to cluster, you know, where there were kind of some abnormal situations and try to, you know, take a deeper dive into that data. So unsupervised learning is really good for kind of the exploratory phase where you just have a big data set, but it's not labeled. You don't have, nobody's gone in and said, oh, this is where a kick was, you know. Um, so, so I think early on, it's the unsupervised learning that really has a big impact as you're trying to cluster and separate data sets and say, okay, this is abnormal, this is normal, or this belongs to kind of one condition or another condition. And then supervised is when your data set is really matured a little bit where you have uh, a cleaner data set where you can train from those, those labels. And then, as you mentioned, reinforcement learning, there's a lot of excitement about that, that uh, you can see the excitement is, is, uh, is really in the potential to learn as you go. It's almost like the way we learn. You know, we get reward functions, uh, rewards for certain actions. And we've seen probably videos where a robot is learning how to walk or a, a stick figure is learning how to walk or you know, something like that. And we all did that as well. So we immediately start relating to the AI that's trying to learn as well. And so that's almost like the way we learned. And, and in, in a sense, that's as long as you can give the right reward to the AI, reinforcement learning is like training a person, you know? And so I think there's a lot of potential there because that's how we learned. And if we want to make computers uh, start thinking like us and making decisions, that's the way you know humans have learned. Uh, so a lot of a lot of excitement uh, over that. I think I think one of the challenges with uh, reinforcement learning is really how do you create what we call the gym? You know, like uh, the simulation environment where it can uh, learn. And sometimes you even have, you know, in like in games and others where computers are learning to play chess, you might have a computer play another version of the machine learning in chess, and then it um, is it can play thousands of games per second, and it learns, uh, and, and both of these agents are starting to uh, get these reward functions, like basically when they do good, they it, it reinforces some of those actions. So, so a lot of a lot of really interesting things happening with with those developments with reinforcement learning. It's a it's a little more difficult because there's kind of a time series element to it, you know, the progression and you're updating the models as you go. But um, so so I guess to back up, starting is going to be unsupervised learning. You're exploring data. You're trying to cluster, make sense of the data sets. Once you do that, you move to supervised learning. Again, this is kind of batch offline. And then when the technology really matures, 
then we're going to see more reinforcement learning applications that become almost like living agents that uh, continue to improve and learn as they go. Got it. So how many years before like reinforcement learning is, uh, you know, is, you know, becomes more popular, like in your mind? Uh, well, you know, I haven't heard of many applications of that right now. So I think in, at least in the oil and gas industry, it's still, um, you know, it, kind of in its infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really couldn't make a prediction on that. I think with any of these areas, there's going to be areas where it just really makes sense. It's kind of easy to apply and just going to have a big impact and other areas where it's just going to be difficult. And, and uh, you know, in my in my distinguished lecture tour one of the interesting things is when i went around talking to people about machine learning in the oil and gas industry in particular when i went to uh, some locations you know there was a i, I had a, a one of the audience members come up and talk to me afterwards and said you know this is this is never going to happen here i said well why you know why won't this happen here i mean you uh, you know, once somebody develops something, best ideas kind of get spread around the world pretty quick. And he said, well, the, kind of the difference here is we don't have a good foundation for digitalization, you know, and, and there's no support for management for that either. Uh, you know, we're kind of stuck in the old way of, of doing things. We don't collect the data. We don't. And, and so I think one of the, the interesting things is that, you know, impact in the oil and gas industry, there are going to be regions where, this is going to have a big impact because of some of the foundation that's already been laid mm -hmm. in terms of digitalization, in terms of management support for data centers, for, uh, for just getting this raw, clean data that we could then use to make decisions in other areas where it hasn't been a priority. And, and then they'll struggle to implement some of these tools because they don't have some of that foundation mm -hmm. that has been laid in other areas. Yeah, I can actually attest to that. You know, like I've been in the industry for 10 years now. And, and when I first started, there was no, like you would not hear about like data warehouses, you know, but now every company almost has it, you know, and they have their data in one central place. And, you know, they have like on-prem versus cloud type of, like, like types of solutions, you know, so you can almost see the progression of, you know, a lot of companies realizing the importance of uh, storing almost all kinds of data from geology to drilling to completions to, you know, like production and reservoir. And, 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 I, and I feel like just over time, you know, uh, even small, even small, very small companies will have their own data centers uh, just because um, people would want to make real-time decisions and, 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 and to make those real-time decisions, you've got to have those, you know, so. That's um, right. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I think a lot of companies and people are waking up to the reality that data, sometimes data is just as valuable as the resources under the ground. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason for that is because if you can make better decisions, you're going to be more competitive in the market. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you're a small, you know, company today, uh, and, and what would you focus on? I know there are a lot of different, you know, areas within AI that you can focus on in different industries, to be honest with you. So if you're a small company today, and I know you've, you've had a lot of background and, and you've done a lot of intelligent projects, uh, which area would you focus on? And what's your recommendation for a small company today? Yeah, good question. Uh, because, you know, honestly, there's, there's so much happening right now and so many companies out there. It feels a little bit crowded at times yeah. with how many people are offering solutions. Yeah. One of the, the interesting things is I've had a student uh, that went and worked for a company and that company was an AI startup. They wanted to do machine learning and they found that the greatest value was not in the machine learning, but it was in the data cleansing, aggregation and preparation. Mm -hmm. And so their company shifted from a machine learning AI company to more of a company that provides this service to take your data and get it into a centralized database to have automated methods to cleanse the data and then prepare it for extracting value out of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that 
you know, machine learning engineers, if you look at the salaries between machine learning engineers and data engineers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, data engineers are responsible for, you know, finding the trends in data sets and developing, you know, basically raw data, turning raw data into something that's more useful to the enterprise. Yeah. And so it's, it's like somebody is collecting data and presenting it in a way that, uh, you know, machine learning engineers can, can use. If you look at the salaries between those two, data engineers are making more money now than you know, machine learning engineers. And if that's any kind of indication about you know small companies, you know the industry right now is is telling is sending a signal to individuals that where a lot of the action is happening is uh, you know we need we need resources that can help get the data to the place where we can do some of these machine learning tasks. Um, and so, and, and just one final perspective on that, you even see companies uh, like Google and others that are trying to further automate even the machine learning engineer job, you know, just with auto ML, or they call it auto machine learning, where they'll take a lot of those tasks and just like in chess where you can play, you know, a person can play one game in, you know, maybe five minutes, but a computer can you know, play a thousand games in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working on methods to take and augment what a machine learning engineer can do uh, with a lot of these hyper parameters and mm -hmm. try all sorts of different combinations and algorithms and uh, automate the pipeline of taking raw data and turning it into actionable information. And it's always going to take somebody to supervise or make sense of the, of the results, but um, I think the part that the computer doesn't do as well at is, you know, the data engineering role, just taking raw, uncleansed, kind of like from different sources and, and getting that all together in one place. Hmm, that's a very interesting perspective. So do you actually think that um, the machine learning jobs would actually go away, you know, like be gone after it becomes a little bit more automated, do you think? No, definitely not. I, and, and that's uh, one of the things that I've, I've seen is that all of these uh, technology developments, even with machine learning, some have, have even asked me, well, is, is this automation, is this machine learning, is it gonna take away my job? And most cases the answer is no. Uh, what it does is it makes people more effective. It, it removes the mundane, the, uh, the tasks that are repetitive and helps you focus on higher level architecture things. And so machine learning engineers are increasingly going to work with some of these auto ML tools or others uh, where they're going to do a lot of the, the heavy lifting work in terms of uh, trying all the different options. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be up to the machine learning engineer really to architect the whole application uh, to look for weaknesses, bad data, try to understand the relationships, put it in context, make presentations to management, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, that, you know, a computer is not going to be able to do. So it just changes the role and moves them, just enables, enables more, enables it uh, a faster turnaround, enable to process more data. It makes the job more effective almost. You can, you know, process more data and get to the bottom of it basically. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. And what, uh, what about some of the biggest, I guess, challenges that you see uh, that could negatively impact the industry uh, of, of, of using AI? Yeah, great question. You know, there's been so much hype about AI and machine learning. You look at a couple quotes like Bill Gates said, a breakthrough in machine learning would be worth 10 Microsofts. Or uh, the director of DARPA said, machine learning is the next internet. Or um, the CTO of, of Sun Microsystems back earlier on, he said, uh, machine learning is gonna result in a real revolution or uh, Jerry Yang, back when he was CEO of Yahoo, machine learning is today's discontinuity. So you look at all these quotes from these leaders and you say, um, you know, there's a lot of hype about machine learning and AI. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that I think the biggest challenge is gonna be the gap between expectation and reality and this technology maturity gap between good ideas and proven industrial standard solutions that have verified benefits. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And, you know, a lot of these applications are still early on. Mm -hmm. And I think when these technologies are overhyped, that you create this expectation, like, oh, just give it data and it's going to give us, you know, this result. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when you get to that kind of situation, it, it creates almost a disillusionment with the technology. And so investment stops and, and it really hinders the progress of that. And I, I really think it's kind of similar to what happened in the nuclear industry and the difference between France and the United States uh, with the nuclear industry. And, and, and kind of one of the interesting things is that in France, it's all, it's all for the most part pro-nuclear and has been for many years. And you look at the differences between those two. And, and one of the things that happened is that, if, if I understand correctly, in France, they had uh, a couple different things that were different. One is uh, they opened up the nuclear plants to tours and let people come in and tour the facility, talk to the engineers, talk to, you know, and I think they had upwards of uh, a couple million people that took those tours. Uh, and, and so in the United States, it was, you know, heavily guarded security don't come in here. And it felt like more of a mystery. And there was kind of this underlying fear, especially with, you know, three mile Island incident and others. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I think the same thing is, is potentially going to happen with AI. And that's one of the biggest challenges is that there's a lot of scary things that are out there about AI, you know, about how it's going to take control or going to, uh, you know, and, and other things that um, make it sound a little bit daunting, like, or, you know, there's big expectations on one project, it doesn't come through, and then management gets disillusioned with it. So I think that, you know, the difference between those two, and if we can learn something from the nuclear industry, is that, you know, people need to get educated on the technologies and understand the strengths and the limitations and have a realistic understanding so that they don't have this gap between expectations and performance. In some areas, it's going to work really well. And in other areas, there's going to be marginal performance. Got it. Got it. No, that's very good. Very good answer, actually. I think I was sitting with Dr. Shahab, I think, uh, a few weeks ago, and he pretty much alluded to the same thing that, you know, it, it could, um, that, that machine learning has been so hyped that, people's expectations have been through the roof and, and, and really uh, you've got to be realistic about it, you know, and especially on a lot of these uh, technologies where we're at a very early phase, you know, of, of developing those technologies. And if you, um, I like to um, under promise and over deliver. <laughs> if you do the opposite, uh, mm -hmm. it would be <laughs> a little bit, just wouldn't look good and people would lose faith in that almost, you know, so which, which you uh, very well touched on. Uh, so also, um, if you had to fill in the blank um, about the future of AI and automation, how would you fill in the blank? The future of AI, AI and automation is? Well, I, I think the answer is uh, you who are listening to this podcast. You know, I think that's the, the future. And it's going to be successful if there's a general understandings of the strengths, especially the limitations. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we've democratized the technology now with, you know, where we have open source tools and others and, and the ways to even learn about it. You know, there's so many good resources online to, to learn. And it's one of the things that I, I really uh, appreciate is it, there's a quote by one of the pioneers in automation and the chemicals and refining industry. His name is Charlie Cutler. And he, he had an interesting quote. Somebody said, what does it take to be successful with one of these, uh, one of these applications? Mm -hmm. um, and he said, there's three things really. You have to know the process you have to know the process and you have to know the process. <laughs> and and uh, it was like, okay, he's really trying to reinforce you have to know the process. And, and I think that, you know, some of these machine learning and AI, you know, those are tools. Mm -hmm. And if we can give those tools to people who really know the process, really know the geology, really know the drilling systems, and, and they have access to the data and they use this as like a tool, an extra tool that they can use to help them make sense of the data, build advisory systems, build 
automation systems. It's really that process. It's, it's those who are adopting the technology, learn about it, uh, managers that support their organization. That's the future of AI. And it's going to be those who are in the oil and gas industry. Uh, there, there's, a, there's kind of an interesting push right now from Silicon Valley, uh, where they've gone to a number of oil and gas companies and they say, we know how to manage your data better than you know how to manage your data. And we can make more sense of it than you can. And, and I think to a certain extent, they're, they are used to dealing with big data and, and how to be able to store and distribute that. Uh, one of the challenges though, that I think is gonna be uh, for those that are you know, in the oil and gas industry, is you have the context, you have the knowledge about the systems, and then you know, you know, what context that data is in, and you're going to be able to make more better decisions about how to use that to extract value. You know, where are the pain points when you're drilling? Where are the pain points when you're looking for resources and you don't want to drill another dry well? Or where are the pain points uh, in in all all types of production and exploration? So you, you who are listening are the future and whether it's adopted or not, it really comes down to education, but then also just kind of getting started, like starting with a project, starting with, with uh, you know, even if it's, a, it's small, just starting somewhere. Mm -hmm. I got you. I got you. And so John, I, you know, I know you have a lot of experience in this area. So uh, what are your, some of your recommendations and advice for people that are starting out in this field? Um, do you have any uh, suggestions, books to read, uh, <laughs> anything in those, you know, sorts of materials? Well, I think you have a good book coming out with Elsevier. Uh, so that I'd, I'm excited to take a look at that as well. Uh, and, you know, there's all, there's other projects or courses, uh, sorry, uh, courses that are online, um, you know, start with a project. Uh, if you, you know, take a day a week, in your current job, if you're allowed to, and, and try new things that you see on Data Science Central or on some of these other you know, blogs or other places online. Um, you know, I also have these uh, videos and courses that I host online. Uh, it's a good place to just get started. You know, you invest a couple hours and just see what you can do with data visualization to start with, and then move on to, you know, cleansing the data, and then trying out some supervised learning or unsupervised learning methods, start asking questions, you know, and see if you can discover some of those questions uh, with the data. So the best, the best place to start is really to do a project, you know, try, try something, ask a question, see what tools are out there. Uh, and, and probably the next best place to start is take a course, you know, uh, go out there. If you don't have an idea or a project yet, take a course that'll give you ideas. Got it. John, you, uh, you said you have a YouTube channel. Uh, what's the name of the YouTube channel? Like, like for the audience, because you have a lot of educational materials like in there, right? Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, it's AP Monitor. I, I started it, you know, about uh, 10 years ago or so. And uh, it was interesting with, you know, the, uh, the pandemic, a lot of education went online and I saw a huge spike in, in terms of the views and comments from those who were, you know, learning from online resources. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I've done is, is also, you know, you, you can learn so much from videos, but I think there's also kind of that personal touch where you're able to connect with somebody and, and learn. So I've also made this uh, the machine learning dynamic optimization course. It starts next week. It's freely available and uh, it allows you to interact not only with me, but also with others in the industry. So we do, uh, you know, these large uh, zoom calls, you know, which is a little bit challenging with that many people, but um, you know, it, it, we do projects together. We, we start together, we learn, and I'm always, uh, so appreciative of those who join the course because, you know, I'm, I'm teaching techniques and methods, but I end up learning so much more from others that join the course as well, that come with their own ideas and challenge, you know, posing challenges or, or, uh, you know, get to see the group projects as well, the result from that. So um, anyway, I'd, I'd say, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd be glad to 
uh, connect. Also, I love connecting on LinkedIn and other places. Uh, so I look forward to doing that with, with anybody who's listening here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, also, if you don't mind, share the, um, the link to your course so I can include it, you know, um, like in this podcast and people can actually, uh, I think there, there'll be a lot of, like a lot more interest from the audience to listen to you and learn from your valuable experience. So uh, uh, that would be great. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I can, I can just share my screen really quick and just share um, the, uh, the course is, is here. It's apmonitor.com slash do. Yep. And then they can just go here to register and it's all online. There's kind of the course map and all the machine learning and other content is, uh, is right here with a lot of videos. So nice. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, all that you do, uh, educating people. Um, and I've, I personally watched some of your YouTube, uh, videos, uh, very educational, very informative. I appreciate that. Um, and also thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule between traveling and teaching and, and educating, you know, to be on this podcast, uh, really great insight today. And, uh, do you have any final thoughts, John? No, I just appreciate, you know, you hosting these. I think this is fantastic that you've, uh, you know, got this, uh, you know, this series that you're, you're working on. Uh, you know, I think this is, this is something that is going to be a great resource. Uh, you know, as you've, you've talked to a number of people across the industry. Um, and I look forward to listening to more of them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening today. I uh, hope you liked it. If you liked it, like share and comment for more visibility. Appreciate you again. Have a great and wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Awesome.